The world is shaping up for a revolution in aviation innovation. In the UK, businesses are already creating new, innovative, greener air transport solutions designed to offer more choice and reduce our carbon footprint. The Future Flight Challenge from UK Research and Innovation aims to create the aviation system of the future, allowing us to improve transport links between regions and in remote areas to connect people to education, jobs and healthcare. Our £125 million investment will allow the UK to build, use and export new transport technologies and be at the forefront of aviation innovation. We're bringing together industry experts to carry out research, development and demonstrations to solve mobility challenges in the UK. By encouraging innovators from a wide variety of sectors to work together, the projects we fund will help shape novel aviation approaches to enable the safe operation of radically new aircraft. Using drones to offer alternative ways of delivering goods and services, both in highly populated and remote areas. Carrying out offshore maintenance and surveillance for the renewable energy sector. The delivery of medical supplies. Surveying buildings after a fire or collapse to reduce the risk to human life. Or post-incident filming for evidence gathering. Using new and sustainable fuel sources to lower carbon emissions from advanced air mobility vehicles and electric or hybrid aircraft to help address the mobility and congestion problems in urban areas and improve travel connections for rural communities where the development of ground infrastructure is difficult. These new modes of air transport will combine in a coordinated airspace where scheduled and on-demand flights work together to move people, goods and services. To enable widespread safe use of autonomous and electric air vehicles, Future Flight will bring together advanced technologies with control and regulation, physical and digital infrastructure systems, and new operating models. This new environment will be a catalyst for businesses to invest in the UK, as we shape the global future of aviation and create a truly integrated aviation system. With a truly all-inclusive approach, Future Flight is transformational and will change our lives. Future Flight Friday webinar. I'm Chris Khan, Innovation Lead for the Future Flight Challenge, and I will be chairing uh, today's panel discussion on the social science considerations for building public trust in future flight. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so today um, I'm going to share a bit with you about um, how we see as a future flight challenge um, the role of uh, what's the important role of social science research in the future flight uh, challenge. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Professor Fern Elson Baker, um, who will present a bit more of uh, the work that we plan to do within the Future Flight Challenge um, on social science research. Then we'll have a, a panel discussion with a fantastic lineup of, of, um, of, of um, panelists uh, to unpack these social science considerations. We'll also then have some Q&A after um, before closing. So if we can just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we've just launched the next phase of funding for the Future Flight Challenge um, with £65 million uh, pounds available to help put the UK at the forefront of the third aviation revolution. We've also published the vision and ambition for future flight in the UK for 2024, when we aim to demonstrate real world services and large scale integrated activities with strong socioeconomic value propositions. We have set out the wider roadmap detailing principal milestones uh, to guide the future flight community to achieve our longer term 2030 vision. Uh, the roadmap highlights the critical importance of not only building public trust, but also demonstrating trustworthiness in future flight. And um, so we recognize the role uh, that social science plays in helping us uh, achieve this. And so we set out to ensure that the future flight challenge is leading socially informed innovation. Um, we wanted to understand how society can be influenced positively and negatively when being introduced to transformative innovations. Um, we wanted to highlight key social science considerations for building public trust in future flight, identifying priority 
social science issues that uh, the challenge and future flight in general needs to address, for example, and these are just some of them, safety, risk, noise, etc. We'll share a bit more about this later. And um, we wanted to identify levers to address challenges in building trustworthiness in future flight, uh, provide recommendations to our community to inform the direction of research and study, and bring guidance to the challenge and the, the wider future flight community to ensure that societal elements are embedded into developments rather than sitting in parallel uh, to the program. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, when we built the roadmap, we started off by first setting the 2030 vision for future flight. Um, uh, we focused on what we call the consumer vision. Now, what we mean by consumer here um, is users uh, and non-users as well of the future aviation system. We highlighted how future flight will serve communities um, with new classes of vehicles, improving accessibility, connectivity, increasing consumer choice, uh, reducing journey times, bringing us goods and services more rapidly with increased convenience um, and within close proximity to us, reducing congestion, minimizing the environmental impact, and bringing us a better and more sustainable user experience with seamless integrated transport. We put the user and the public at the center of the vision and worked from there to establish the, the roadmap. Now, when we think as industry, when we think of social license to operate, we think of public trust as a barrier, a challenge posed by society that we must overcome. But we must understand that publics are not the barrier to new technology, but the user, the consumer, the investor. So we, we must unpack the broader aspects of building public trust with social, social science research. And to do this, we've appointed um, the Future Flight Research Director for, so, for Social and Economic Research, Professor Fern Elson Baker. And um, she is the Director of Research of the Research Institute for STEM in Culture and Society at the University of Birmingham, and recently joined our team and it's a pleasure for me to welcome her as my new colleague to share more on how we're going to tackle this together. Fern? Great. Thank you, Carissa, for such a lovely introduction. Um, and it's been um, really interesting and, and great fun to start working with the challenge. So we're really looking forward to the work that we can achieve together over the next 10 months. So um, just today, I'm just going to give a bit of a flavour of the kind of work that we want to do um, within the Future Flight um, uh, challenge and I'm working with my team at Birmingham which includes Louise Reardon who is also on our panel today and Will Mason Wilkes um, and we're working um, as part of the Future Flight team but also working with colleagues in the Economic and Social Research Council um, to really sort of think through a sort of a whole systems approach to thinking about the social economic, environmental um, and cultural considerations we need to think about in terms of realising that uh, 2024 roadmap, but also the 2030 vision. Um, so th today I'll just touch on some of the top level core research themes that we've been working on, which were actually developed out of an ESRC working group that ran last year that um, Louise and Charlotte, who are also on the panel today, were part of as well. Um, and then we'll be talking through some of the um, activities we'll be undertaking the next 10 months, and also thinking through um, ways that you can get involved, ways that we can collaborate and work together. But we'll come to that towards the end. Next slide, please. So just to give a sort of flavour of the kind of work we want to do, um, I'm just going to run very quickly through these top level themes. Um, now, obviously, as Carissa has highlighted, public trust and trustworthiness are important, but they are not the whole picture in terms of understanding the broader um, social economic um, context and concerns that we need to address when undertaking social sciences in this domain. So, as I said, we're trying to um, build a more whole systems approach to understanding future flight technologies, infrastructure, amenities and services within that broader kind of social picture. To do this, we've identified these top level themes, and I'll just give, give a quick overview. So the first one is understanding the innovation ecosystem. As the Future Flight Challenge encompasses quite a complex range of cross-sector companies and stakeholders, it's really vital that we build a much clearer picture 
of how that innovation ecosystem that we're all operating in works, who's in it, who's not in it, who needs to be in it. Um, this will enable us to, to better think through issues relating to governance, um, new business and operating models, alongside issues within organisations like organisational trust, um, awareness within um, different uh, parts of workforce, for example, um, and different behaviours that might actually act as an obstacle as well. As Carissa said, it's, it's not just uh, about publics. Secondly, we need to really expand our collective understanding um, of public perceptions. Obviously, because these are emerging technologies, there is very little data actually in terms of what publics might think of these technologies. This needs to take into account a, a very broad cross section and diversity of perspectives across a, a broad range of different stakeholders and communities across society. This needs to include potential users and non-users alike. Um, this is far more complicated than simply trying to understand whether publics might be receptive to technologies they currently, to be honest, for the most part, aren't actually aware of yet. Um, we need to build a much more comprehensive understanding of public's interests and concerns. This means not only focusing on public's trust, but awareness, behaviours, and ultimately the social desirability of the new aviation technologies, infrastructure and services that are being proposed. Clearly, this work will need to take place over a number of years, um, not least because public perspectives are going to change as different technological capabilities come online or become more apparent, or as they start to actually impact on different individuals, groups or communities day to day lives. Um, so this is an ongoing piece of work. Anything we do now would just be a snapshot, but we will be doing that. We will come to that in a bit. Um, thirdly, we need to really dig down and think about differential impacts on different communities and environments. So we need to build a comprehensive and cross-disciplinary understanding of the potential impacts within different urban and rural environments. This includes considering a, a range of different factors. So one, for example, is noise and visual pollution. Another is differential perspectives in terms of privacy, different issues around planning at the local, regional or national level. The different implications in terms of infrastructure development, as well as much broader sort of environmental concerns about climate, pollution, um, local habitats or wildlife, for example. So it's quite a comprehensive piece of work that needs to be undertaken there that crosses over a range of different disciplines. Fourthly, it's really, really quite important that we actually dig a lot deeper into understanding the impacts on broader society and communities that will be engendered by future flight technologies. And this means examining in detail the issues in relation to broader socioeconomic factors, impact on employment and workforces, um, and of course, equality, diversion and inclusion across different social groups. This needs to include engaging with these communities and stakeholders from the outset, directly and at an early stage. Um, finally, we need to consider the trustworthiness of these technologies as opposed to the public trust in these technologies. So this is really sort of undertaking the pieces of work that need to be done to sort of drill down in much more detail to think through safety, risks, the necessary legal and um, regulatory frameworks, or indeed the um, in ensuing ethical issues that may arise. So this is a huge undertaking, um, as not only are these emergent technologies, but this is an emergent area of social study. So next slide, please. So as it's an emergent field of study, we really, really need to grow capacity in this area. And that, that's on both sides. We need to think about this in terms of growing social science research capacity, as well as building those networks that comprehensively link in people from across industry, policy and regulatory stakeholders, public sector and academic communities. And this is, um, I think the key thing here is, is it's really vital that we bring uh, social scientists into these conversations early on. Um, there is this real need to engage across these sectors and obviously there are areas of extant expertise that we can draw on um, in related fields and obviously our panellists will um, reflect on some of this in um, the questions, no doubt. And whilst there's a lot of work to be done, um, as a researcher, I think this is a hugely exciting area of study, um, primarily because fu the future flight technologies that we're talking about have the, um, the potential to impact on so many different facets of our day to day lives. So it, it's, a, it's not just an, an exciting area of um, uh, new technologies, it's actually a really exciting and interesting area for social science research as well. Um, what I want to do next then is outline some of the key activities that myself and the team at Birmingham, as well as colleagues and um, collaborating um, social scientists from across the UK will be involved in um, over the next 10 months. So next slide, please.
Okay, so as I indicated, we will be undertaking some baseline um, sort of trend mapping, so undertaking a nationally representative survey. Um, and again, as I said, this will be much more than just looking at potential for public acceptance. We really sort of need to unpick a lot of the sort of social narratives and the perceived impact, as well as the social desirability of these um, emerging technologies. So this will build a broad ranging baseline of UK public perceptions that will help us outline future research, but also give us something that we can then sort of build into future um, surveys that may be undertaken in, in uh, years to come. Obviously, as I said, public perceptions will shift as emerging technologies and um, technological capabilities and technologies come online um, and they will shift um, as they become more apparent, apparent in sort of public space discourse um, and discussion. At the moment, uh, most of the work that's been done has been focused on drones and obviously as we're all aware in the future flight community, there's a lot more to a future flight than just sort of drones. So um, we'll be building on the extant work but also developing something that covers all of the types of technologies within the future flight um, challenge. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is a really important one. It's one that we've already started doing. So we're looking at um, mapping the wider innovation ecosystem. So um, this really is sort of mapping the relevant stakeholders with a view to better understanding the wide range of organisations, agendas and aspirations within this dynamic and at points quite fluid innovation ecosystem. This will allow us to build a, a better picture of the dynamics and the intra and intra um, organisational relationships involved in order to better think through the sort of um, flow of um, uh, values and knowledge across the um, future flight landscape. Um, this will not only allow us to identify who's involved, but actually probably more importantly, who's not involved and who needs to be involved to realise that um, 2024 roadmap and the 2030 vision. Next slide, please. So um, tying in with a sort of broader piece um, in terms of uh, public perceptions and public engagement and uh, social desirability, we will be looking to take some first stage steps towards building larger programmes of public dialogue and consultation. And this will take two forms in the first instance. We're looking at ways we can create opportunities for reciprocal dialogue and deliberation with publics um, about their interests and concerns in relation to future flight aviation systems. Um, and this is really that opportunity to get some real insight in a much more sort of drilled down, much deeper way than we can do with the survey about the social desirability of some of these technologies um, and informing that process from the outset with, with um, a sort of much richer, um, much more sort of comprehensive understanding of some of those concerns, pushbacks um, or perceptions that might um, be sort of surrounding some of these technologies as they emerge. We can also undertake some smaller scale targeted consultation with specific communities of interest and obviously we can work closely with award holders um, in phase three to, to undertake some of that work. All of this together um, will form the sort of baseline for future public engagement work, as well as helping us to identify um, key um, priority areas of social scientific research that needs to be undertaken in the future. It will provide us with, as I said, that sort of deeper dive into public perspectives um, that will sort of act in concert with the survey, which only really can give us a sort of indicative sort of trend um, mapping sort of approach. So this works together, um, but also gives us something which I think is really important, which is allowing public voice in innovation right from the early stage. Um, the next slide, please. Finally, uh, we'll be running five co-creation workshops around the top level themes that I've identified. Um, this will really allow us to work collectively um, across um, all of the relevant stakeholders in the innovation ecosystem, future flight award holders, um, regulatory bodies, policy makers, academics, um, local and regional governments. Um, there are all sorts of people that need to be in the room to help us think through what the sort of, dare I say, social science roadmap looks like um, as we move towards 2024 and 2030. So it's really, really quite important to us to, to work collectively to, to, to sort of build that vision for the future social science um, research that needs to be undertaken, not just in the next two years, but in the next 10 to 15 years. So the transformational, transformational research that will support the future flight challenge into the future. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Fern. Um, so now we'll move on to the panel discussion. And I'll introduce uh, our panelists for today. So first, uh, Professor Jack Stilgo, 
um, as an associate professor in science and technology studies at the University College London, where he researches the governance of emerging technologies. Welcome, Jack. Um, Dr. Lewis Reardon is a senior lecturer in governance and public policy at the Institute of Local Government Studies at the University of Birmingham, and her research focuses on governance and public policy, transport and well-being. Uh, professor Lucy Budd is a professor of aid transport management at De Montfort University. Her research explores issues of commercial air transport policy operations and management. And Professor Charlotte Clark, a uh, professor of epi epidemiology in the Population Health Research Institute at St George's University of London. And her research explores how physical environments affect physical and mental health. And she's an expert in the field of environmental noise effects on health. So welcome to all panelists. Thanks. So I'll, I'll kick off the, the discussion with um, a question for uh, Professor Jack Silgo, please. So what are the most important things you think we should consider when undertaking public engagement or dialogue in this area. Fern has highlighted um, the plans for us to do this um, with the Future Flight Challenge. Um, but what do you think are some of the most important things to consider? Thanks, Chris, um, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So um, I, I come at this as somebody with, you know, I have a lot of experience of doing social research on new technologies, but also doing public dialogue on new technologies. So I, I spent a lot, lot, a few years working with ScienceWise, the government's public dialogue on, on science and technology uh, unit. Um, and I invested a lot of time in trying to sort of negotiate the framing for that public dialogue, because what you see if you do a lot of this stuff is a lot of different motivations coming in. So different actors have very different reasons for wanting to go out and, and engage members of the public or find out what they think. Mm -hmm. um, some of those people think that, you know, it's a good thing in and of itself as part of living in a democratic society. Some people um, like me think it's absolutely crucial to understand what people think in order to design better technologies and to come up with better, uh, better policies. So that's a sort of substantive motivation. But there's mm -hmm. also a sort of dominant motivation that we might call sort of instrumental, which is the idea that we should go out and talk to people and listen to what they think because we think it's going to build trust in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you go into public dialogue with that motivation, you're going to be disappointed, you're going to waste your money, you're going to waste your time, and nothing looks less trustworthy than the attempt to manufacture public trust. So I think if we get if we find ourselves stuck in the language of building trust and building public acceptance and expecting social scientists or public engagement to do that job for us, then we're missing the point. I think at some point we have to say, we have to ask, you know, what is, what is amenable to change here? There's no point doing public engagement unless something might change as a result of it. Is that about building better technologies? technologies that, for example, are of benefit to more than just rich people or people who already have access to multiple modes of, of mobility? Or is it about coming up with technology, coming up with policies to assure that those, those technologies are safe, uh, beneficial, sustainable, protecting public interests in all, all that sort of way? Unless, we, unless there is something that might change as a result of public dialogue, then it's not worth doing. Yeah. Um, picking up on your point about um, Fern and I were discussing about, you know, we think that you know, when we're setting out a roadmap, we would, okay, we raise awareness, then that's going to, um, uh, you know, improve the public perception of, of these technologies, then we will gain trust. And it just, it just does not go in that, in that direction. It's not so clear cut. Um, uh, Fern, I don't know if you want to come in with your thoughts on that or Jack. I think Jack is making a very good point and it's something that we've been discussing quite a lot within the Future Flight Challenge team. Um, and that's why we need to sort of really sort of think about where there's a social desirability. Uh, 
for, for these technologies, but also think hand in hand about the way that we understand sort of the future flight landscape, the sort of the, the things that we're bringing to the table, our visions of what society um, should look like in the future. Because this isn't just about new modes of transport, it's about how we might live our lives in the future. And sort of that, that sort of whole systems approach to sort of sense check that the assumptions we're making relate to the sort of the kind of perspectives people might have in terms of what's socially desirable across a broader range of beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries or users or non-users. I think um, Jack's entirely right. There's, and it's it's quite exciting that we can do this quite early on because we don't often get to be this far upstream actually having these kind of conversations. So I think as you quite rightly highlight this. The 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 added advantage here is is building technologies that are sort of more likely to, to sort of fulfill those social desire the desires or, or kind of wants or needs beyond just sort of elite groups and niche groups as you, as you quite rightly say jack so i think there is something quite so it's flipping it around the other way isn't it really um and that's what we mean by socially informed innovation fantastic and it was our attempt when we put together our roadmap to start with the user you know start put them at the center and then build out from there instead of I guess uh, the traditional industry approach where we develop the technology and say, hey, look at all the fantastic things we've done for you, now use it. Um, no, exactly. so, can I just, can I yeah. just jump in? So you, you start with users. Remember that most of the public in terms of how you're thinking about them in this conversation will not be users. So you also Actually. need to, you need to be able to consider the possibility of the public as citizens as well as just users of the technology. Citizens are after, often an afterthought in okay. questions of innovation because users, it's easy to design for users. Uh -huh. right? It's much harder to design for citizens and to build citizens' views into. But you know, with, with any mobility technology, just think of the various ro roles that members of the public will play. Most of the time, they will be bystanders, but their mm -hmm. views, especially when we come to you know, questions of of pollution and 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 other forms of yeah. externality right the citizen yeah. view might be much more important than the user view that's true in terms of exactly like you said noise pollution um you know if i've got drones flying above my house but i'm not using that for my delivery of packages that still impacts me even though i'm not a user thank you um i'm, I'm learning so much as um uh, as the industry um um, perspective uh, within the Future Flight Challenge, um, bringing on Fern, and we've been having these discussions of just really expanding our knowledge. And this is where it starts, really, um, of bringing that insight and perspective to the Future Flight community that can be heavily industry-based, like my background. Um, Jack, I'll ask you as well, um, so what do you think might be a constructive role for um, social scientists in the development of new aviation technologies or autonomous forms of transport, which I believe is very much um, in your area of study. Yeah, thanks. So we, we published a paper, a, a large, large group of us social scientists published a paper asking this question with respect to autonomous vehicles on the, on the road. Once we reject the idea that social science is about helping innovators to sell their technologies which i guess is the sort of caricature for how social science is somehow imagined it's like mm -hmm. here's our technology how do you sell it to a skeptical public what mm -hmm. might the constructive role be and there the the conclusion that we reached in that in that paper was that social science is vital actually in understanding and building socio-technical systems in all of their complexity so often a particular, and, and it, it, this particularly applies to autonomous technologies, often we sort of centre the gadget, the drone, right, the vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. But anybody that knows anything about innovation in this space knows that for that technology to work, it requires a massive set of relationships between people, infrastructures, devices. Um, some of those things are invisible data infrastructures. Getting all of that to work means recognizing the social complexity in, in, involved in, in doing all of that. So ultimately this is about you know, challenging the sort of utopian benefits that are often offered around, around technology, but not to say, oh, these technologies will never do what, they're, what, it, what has been promised, but to ask, what would it take, right? If you're selling a technology, like as, as we had on, 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 uh, on the slides, 
right? Techn new technologies come with promises to be more efficient, safer, cleaner, greener, easier, mm -hmm. right? They don't do that by themselves. What would it take for that to happen? And that's where social science plays a role in designing good systems, good policies, um, understanding unintended consequences, asking you know questions that engineers can never answer by themselves, like the classic one being how safe is safe enough? There's no mm -hmm. right answer to the question of acceptable risk. And mm -hmm. so social scientists have a huge amount to contribute in terms of, of, of answering that. And they would say things like, well, the question of how safe is safe enough is also related to the question of safe enough for what, right? Mm -hmm. if, a, if a technology yeah. poses dangers to bystanders, for example, those bystanders are gonna say, well, you know, who's benefiting from this technology? And there are lots of examples in the history of flight showing, showing this. Um, and if the benefits of that technology are widely spread, then it's extraordinary how much risk we will accept. Look at the million plus people who die because of car crashes every every year, mm. right? That's not it's not okay to say that. It's just it's just you know that is part of the social contract of that of that technology, which is you know we can we can argue about. But when it comes mm. to technologies that only benefit a lucky a lucky few, people's assessments of risk will be very different. And social scientists have done a lot of work on where those assessments of risk uh, come from. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Now, um, and really good for, for the community to consider. Um, I'm going to just move to Lucy. Uh, we talk about, um, I highlighted, you know, the, the benefits to the citizens um, uh, that it would bring in terms of connectivity and accessibility. But how do you think um, the public's response to future flight technologies might vary across regions or different localities? Thank you, Carissa. I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there. This is all about geographies for me. Mm -hmm. This is about understilling, and for the sake of brevity, I'll distill it to three key words. This is fundamentally about people. So which people are we talking about? In what context are they interfacing with future flight technologies? Where are they? Which leads me on to the second key note of place and actually understanding the physical and socioeconomic dimensions of these particular regions, of these particular locations, where these technologies might be deployed. So what sort of people are actually residing there? What sort of exposure and uptake to new technology have they already exhibited? Whether that's something as ubiquitous as smartphones through to solar or wind power, through to electric vehicle charging points, for example, because all of that can give us a really useful evidence base on which to construct and inform the future flight challenge. And the final keyword is this one that has been mentioned a number of times already in the presentations. It's about these publics. And again, we can have a very interesting debate about what actually constitutes a public we well know that the population is not homogenous. As Fern identified in their opening presentation, perceptions evolve. You know, understanding that multiple different communities are not only highly dynamic, but have very complex and often intersecting interests and priorities. So how can we then embed that in the development of the Future Flight Challenge? And that presents a very exciting proposition. I agree. Thank you. And so what do you think, um, what are the most important things you think we, sh we need to be aware of, um, considering the role of different um, social and economic factors um, might play across different groups or communities? So, you know, just thinking of the uptake and impact of future flight technologies, what do you think would be the most important things we need to be aware of? Well, I think having a very good understanding of those populations, those publics, so the demographics, the age profile, particular accessibility um, needs that they might exhibit and how they might evolve over time. So actually really understanding the people who, as Jack rightly said, are not only potentially going to be using these technologies, but also potentially going to be affected by them and ensuring the potential benefits and any possible externality effects are effectively managed and also shared. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Fern, I don't know if you want to come in um, uh, on that thought as well. I, I think that it's, it's, it's as um, this is highlighting, it's kind of, it's, thinking about these dynamic, dynamics are going to be quite important and I think it's, 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 it's um, going to be really um, important that we sort of think about sort of that geography and, and people and place in a sort of much more systemic way um, in terms of sort of um, thinking about um, 
it's not just as, as as Lucy said, it's not just about, you know, different communities behaving in homogenous ways, homogenous ways within sort of one community. There are all sorts of intersectional issues we need to take account within groups. So where we're sort of designing the research, we are thinking at level of individual, level of group and community. So we'll be taking different approaches in terms of the social science, looking at issues around um, social psychology as well in relation to um, different communities that may be beneficiaries or non-beneficiaries as, as we mentioned earlier so. and it's all part of you know we set the vision as we want this to be as inclusive um, it needs to be inclusive so it needs to benefit across all uh, communities it's where we set the vision we must work towards this so helping um, the community developing these technologies to take into account those considerations would be would be really really helpful and useful to help us achieve that. Um, okay, so I want to just move um, to uh, policy and regulation. So I'll move to Dr. Louise Raritan. Um, and we've highlighted on the roadmap as well, you know, legislation, policy, milestones, things that we need to achieve by 2024, by 2030. Now, from a social science perspective, um, what do we need to consider from a social science perspective in terms of local, regional, and national regulation and policy making um, in relation to new aviation technologies. Thanks, Carissa. Um, well, I think the thing for me is that these new technologies and products are bringing flight, you know, right to the doorstep. Um, and so the local level is going to become ever more important. And I'm at a local government institute, so of course I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but I think it's not just an issue in terms of, you know, local authorities in terms of their role in planning, but also because really this is where, as, as the other contributors have indicated, future flight is really going to have an impact, uh, both for users and um, non-users and where the impacts are going to be seen. Um, and as Lucy just alluded to there, you know, every locality is different, different economies, different citizen demographics, different geographies. So for me, I think a one size fits all approach to policy making and regulation has the potential to be problematic. So I think mm -hmm. as social scientists, be that uh, political scientists, human geographers, sociologists, I think we can start to think about some of these questions about what might be the most appropriate scale for regulation or policy making to actually sit at and at what moment do we need to be having those conversations you know are there tensions with existing policy frameworks that might need to be revised or do we need to create new ones are there tensions across different scales that we might not have had with other flight technologies but might be emerging now and i think um, if we're aiming towards an integrated transport system that supports net zero which i think we should all have at the forefront of our mind where is the most appropriate place for power to lay in that you know if we're thinking about having effective last mile solutions and mm -hmm. um, you know how can we ensure that future flight actually works in harmony and adds value to our existing transport provision you know so we're really thinking about the whole ecosystem when we're thinking about policy we're not just thinking about the technology thinking about how it fits within that current landscape you know to really mm -hmm. add value there and when we think of policy and legislation, we think of the lead time to develop this. Um, and as Fern highlighted earlier, you know, we're, we're starting quite upstream of, um, of development. So it's, it's a good thing that we start um, unpacking this with our community so that we can start thinking about, um, uh, you know, developing that legislation to meet those milestones. It's almost like you feel like we should have started yesterday um, <laughs> to, to develop this. So um, what insight do you think uh, can social scientists provide to help us better understand that future flight landscape? Um, and what are the implications for realizing this roadmap and vision for 2030 that we've set out? Um, well, well, the first thing that really comes to my mind is what Jack, Jack already said, which is that we talk a lot about the general public and public perception to raise public awareness and, and grow acceptance. But for me, they're not the only important stakeholder or stakeholders that are potential roadblocks for innovation. 
So for me, I really see future flight as not only having the potential to disrupt and revolutionize aviation, but the wider ecosystem of transport and mobility and in turn society. So not just how we get around or where we commute to, but also the types of jobs we have and the skills we need for that, which are you know, reflected in the roadmap. So we need to really understand, you know, to my mind, who the stakeholders are that can have an influence on the innovation in an ecosystem directly and indirectly and, and this comes back to that users, non-users point, people who actually, whether they recognize their stakeholders or not, yeah. have an influence in this area. So I'm thinking here of anyone from the mayor of a combined authority to the CAA mm -hmm. to taxi drivers and workers unions, you know, who might have a real vested interest in, and concern about the impact of future flight for them and their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think... Um, we really need to understand, you know, what their views are of these technologies, what their concerns are, but what they actually might see as opportunities that we yes. might not be thinking about when we're, you know, developing these technologies to help identify, you know, where those priorities are. And then really understanding the relationships between these stakeholders mm -hmm. and their spheres of influence to understand, yeah. you know, where might have the resources that we can tap into for scaling and delivery, but also where we might need to actually target some resource to help overcome some of these barriers. And going back to Jack's point, social scientists are you know, expert in identifying and engaging with stakeholders and also that translation between groups. And so I really see you know, our expertise in methods and participatory methods as being key here as well, as well as the actual expertise in the area. Mm -hmm. And I think, so when we started building this roadmap and um, when we publish it we recognize gosh just how many stakeholders are involved and we wanted to share with the community one to recognize their role you know it's not just about future flight and developing future flight in the UK does not just sit with the future flight challenge it's broader than that um, and the stakeholders um, uh, needs to recognize their role in developing this and seeing uh, where it fits on that on that timeline as well. Um, a really good point about understanding the interdependencies of different stakeholders. Like you said, some stakeholders may not re realize they've got a place <laughs> um, in order to achieve this. So it's about raising that as well. And I know I'll ask Fern to come in. Some work that we're looking to do is um, some stakeholder um, mapping, understanding that ecosystem better, the roles and the interdependencies of, 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 um, of the stakeholders in that in, in, in the community. Fern? Yeah, no, I, I, I think this is an integral piece of work that we need to do. And I think it's, it's again, I think reflecting back on what Lucy Louis uh, Lucy Lewis and Jack have said already is that this is, this is quite a complex, complicated set of sort of um, sort of interrelated different things that we need to look at, and we can't think of the innovation ecosystem as disconnected from publics. After all, we're all members of the public to each other, um, so we need to think in a very sophisticated way about the sort of blurred boundaries of that innovation ecosystem, and also think who's as I indicated earlier. When you think who's not involved already, as Louis highlighting that it's not just publics and public trust or acceptance that potentially sort of derails um, new technologies. So we we do need to sort of think in a sort of much more sort of sophisticated way about how we approach both those um, areas of work um, at the same time. Um, and I think the other thing that's really, really important is that we need to remember that the same things that might impl influence public perceptions in their broadest sense also influence people within that innovation ecosystem. So for example, it could be that there are people within the organisations that are integral to delivery of um, new technologies where there is significant organisational distrust, for example, that might impact on the delivery of those or implementation of those systems. So it's 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 so multi-layered. Um, I think it's really important and you know very timely that we do this early. And I think some of the work that's already been done has been really Important, obviously, we're looking forward to sharing that more broadly in the future. Mm -hmm. And with the future flight being just, you know, it's such a diverse uh, community. We're, we're building this community um, every day. And that's something that the Future Flight Challenge has been doing, convening the right people. So it's the, the ecosystem is developing. Um, so we're, we're, it's not tradi just traditional aerospace. It continues to, to develop and we need to understand better those um, those influences um, from the different stakeholders on each other as well. Um, a lot for us to, uh, to work on. Um, so I'd like to move uh, to Professor Charlotte Clark um, and ask her, 
So what can we learn from civil aviation um, about human response to future flight technologies? Thanks, Carissa. I think we can learn quite a lot, despite the very different nature of the technologies that, that there are. Um, we know very little at the minute about how communities will respond to these new technologies. It's a complete unknown. Um, communities are going to have a new, you know, be exposed to new unfamiliar noise signatures. And really, when we look at civil aviation, just as a comparator, the biggest response there is annoyance and annoyance is being and feeling annoyed, bothered or disturbed and in some way feeling that there's that unfair exposure to a noise source and you've got no control of that. And actually, policymakers as well as communities take annoyance really seriously. It's used to inform policy. We tend to measure it around airports, for example, to get a measure of that impact. And actually civil aviation, I think this is really where future flight can learn. Civil aviation had a really reactive um, approach to the noise issues. Mm -hmm. You know, it was only really once communities organized themselves, got quite loud about it themselves, that, that really civil aviation had to start to, to look and have conversations with their neighbors and to think through some of these issues. And um, that led to a lot of mistrust. And I think here there is that opportunity to try and build some knowledge as we go. And actually, you're also talking about a new exposure and that really can increase annoyance as well. People don't respond as you might predict. They're actually more annoyed than we would predict using the evidence we use. Mm -hmm. And also there's also this interaction. So the more annoyed you get, the more negative your attitudes get and the more negative your attitude, the more annoyed you are. And you end up in this sort of dance over these two things. So I think really this is an opportunity for, for that we don't know how people will react and we really need to start to look at that and that needs social scientists. I mean, looking at health, looking at well-being, quality of life, how we assess these things, how you decide who are you go, who's your population, who is, we've used lots of words, but who, who do you think you might influence and how are you going to show that you're not influencing them or what the effect is? And if we look at these things and start to build knowledge, there are opportunities here that we may be able to change the design of the technology slightly to reduce mm -hmm. effects. We can think about how the infrastructure is designed, the planning. So there are ways here that we can sort of try and avoid some of the issues, I think, that civil aviation has experienced. Mm -hmm. I think as someone who's moved from the Cotswolds to London recently, this new exposure to construction noise and annoyance, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I can definitely relate to the level of annoyance. And that's, it's a new exposure for me, something I didn't have to deal with before. And we're going to be introducing these new technologies. So it's about engaging with our um, uh, developers of the technology to make sure that we're taking into account the level of annoyance and um, uh, that would be, well, acceptable. Um, for yeah, the there's a tendency, I think, within the, the industry to think that these are much quieter than airplanes, and of course they are, but actually it could be other aspects. We see, no, we see these effects at lower noise levels than we used to. The number of events are going to be really important for annoyance, but also the sound itself. You know, if you just take drones, they're quite high frequency, a lot of, you know, sort of tonality. These things we don't know so well how people react to. And so there, it's, I don't want to be negative, but I think we need to look at it and at least try and build some knowledge about it. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. OK, so I'll move to, um, back to Fern. So, um, right, how are we going to integrate and embed this, this into the phase three competition? We've got lots of things to unpack, a lot of considerations to take into account. In a practical sense, how are we going to integrate this and embed it into the phase three competition? Okay, well, obviously, 
social scientists have the tendency to complexify and obviously we've as we've indicated in the discussion so far this is an incredibly um complex set of problems but that doesn't mean we can't approach that in a sort of um in in a twofold way in terms of thinking about the work that needs to be done within phase three consortia groups but also that sort of top level sort of um, cross-cutting work that we've been discussing a bit today um obviously we expect that during um phase three many of the applicants will be keen to undertake some um social research around specific use cases or company specific um, issues, uh, maybe that's relating to potential consumers, it might be in relation to um, the financial viability, um, it could be that they're interested in um, engaging or undertaking research with specific communities that may be positively or negatively impacted on by their particular area of focus, so linking back to um, uh, as Charlotte was saying in terms of thinking about the neighbours. Um, uh, so. Um, Obviously, as the phase three competition um, applicants are going through that process, we'll be on hand to offer advice and support throughout. Um, so throughout the application process and as people are starting to set up that um, uh, research um, embedded within um, their consortia groups and, and, and projects. So yeah. we'll be there to help think through how this might be best achieved and the best ways that we can add value to those. Mm -hmm. Um, cases. So obviously where individual consortia are looking at specific use cases, we'll be able to do some of that sort of more cross-cutting work that connects it together and has relevance across the sector. And, and just picking up one of the questions um, that's been asked um, by our audience, will we be using um, an interactive platform um, to permanently engage everyone? This is a, a very good question. Um, and yes, I think that's probably something that we should be uh, looking into. Um, and so basically, my response to that would be watch this space and we'll look for the right solutions for that. But basically, you're here. Um, so reach out if you need us. Okay. And uh, picking up another question from the Q&A. Um, so several companies have publicly started um, I think that's meant to say stated, uh, they will be flying their first aircraft by 2024. Um, is that your understanding and how will you achieve your objectives by then? So I'll pick up the, the question on, um, yes, a lot of um, OEMs for uh, air taxis um, have put their stated their entry into service will be from 2024, um, whether they're going to meet that target or not. Um, we, we need to prepare um, infrastructure regulations, etc. All of these things for that entry into service, and um, by 2024. In terms of, are we going to achieve our objectives of, uh, by then? In terms of, um, I'll give a social science, um, I'll give a future flight challenge response to that. We have set the vision and ambition to make sure that we're um, integrating um, this into our demonstrations um, for 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 2024 so by 2024 we're looking to have we've asked we've set the vision and um some demonstration scenarios to make sure that we're um demonstrating community engagement on flight planning for example for environmental and safety impacts and we're demonstrating use cases that actively engage with the public and provide social benefits and support social acceptability now this isn't a, a problem that's going to be solved by 2024 it's going to be ongoing and using those demonstrations we we intend to help that so it's not something that works in silos we demonstrate technology and social science research continues it's something we're looking to integrate with phase three and that's the vision and ambition for 2024 and um, for the future flight challenge Fern, i don't know if you want to come in on that yes. And I think, as, as we've highlighted, there is a there's a huge amount of work that does need to be done in terms of the social science research. So we're very much envisaging that we will be building a sort of roadmap moving forward that maps on to the future flight roadmap and vision to 2024 and then to 2030. Um, as Chris has highlighted, obviously, there will be the potential for demonstrations um, and pu public to engage, publics to engage with those demonstrations up until 2024. But I think we need to be conscious of the fact that we need to undertake that sort of broader work around that, partly because when you're demonstrating new, um, new uh, forms of aviation, the kinds of people who may ordinarily become engaged with that may already be the people who are sort of and um, doesn't really give us that sort of broader cross-section of people who will be beneficiaries or non-beneficiaries downstream. The other thing is that I highlighted um, in my presentation, Public views, um, concerns, interests, everything um, that we're talking about, both 
actually within publics and within the innovation ecosystem are going to be dynamic they're going to be fluid through the next few years because everything is going to be changing quite rapidly and quite quickly um, and so we need to think about having a sort of adaptive um, sort of uh, mode of research moving through where we don't just think we can do one thing by 2024 we need to have a plan that goes for a number of years forward mm -hmm. any data we collect now would just be a snapshot but it's going to change absolutely jack i think you wanted to come in yeah yeah if i could just pick up on something that, that that charlotte said that i think is is so important in how we think about especially if we're talking about moving from demonstrators to fully functioning systems and it's something that I think we don't think about very much which is the question of scale and Charlotte mentioned it particularly about mm -hmm. about noise mm -hmm. there's a sort of tendency for innovators to say um, you know here is the one object look at it doing its thing and to resist the imagination of a world in which there are a thousand of those objects going around right a single car is a novelty a city full of cars is a problem, mm. right? And it's a problem that needs to be addressed because of its scale. Two people communicating on Facebook is a novelty. When there are two billion users of Facebook, it becomes more powerful than some countries' governments. And mm. that question of scale and scaling up becomes so important in how we think about um, how we think about innovation. Again, there is so there's lots of work in the social science of, of innovation studies that, that explains those questions of, of scale. But often we, it's, it's a classic one that we postpone until it's a downstream conversation, by which time it's too late to do much about it. Noted. And on the roadmap, we've had like, yes, 2024 demonstration, next phase, scaling. So we need to be, start thinking about that now, if for only wanted to come in. I, I think that makes an excellent point, as did um, Charlotte. And I think that's one of the things I was indicating when I was saying that perce perceptions and viewpoints and interests and concerns are going to shift because as people start to see the real world implications of that sort of scaling up, I think that's where we're going to potentially see significant areas of pushback. Um, so, and it's something that, I mean, again, picking up on another point that Jack made, these, these, these sort of unforeseen sort of um, uh, sort of uh, pushbacks or implications they're not really unforeseen we can actually predict some of them and that's where social sciences is going to be absolutely vital um, I think as well just to respond to one of the other questions that's in the chat because I think this sort of actually relates to this um, so, um, I, 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 you can read it or I can read it. No, yes um, uh, so how are we weaving uh, in the financial aspects of future flight into research and um, for instance if the viable business models of future flight projects don't match um, preferred regulations and policies I think this is this is key. I mean, ultimately, I think as 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 um, all the panelists have sort of indicated in different ways. Um, ultimately, there is a lot of money being spent in this domain at the moment, um, and it's really important that we understand that one those regulations and policies they're not necessarily that they're the preferred ones of X set of experts. They're the ones that are socially acceptable. Um, more broadly, um, obviously in a democratic society. Um, and it's important for us to recognise that if we don't engage with these issues upstream, there is a significant um, uh, potential for money to be invested in sort of pathways of innovation that will never come to fruition because they aren't viable either financially or within a sort of broader functioning of a democratic society. So that's one of, I think, the strongest arguments for people to come and sort of engage with us and work with us because ultimately we can help think that through in a much more sophisticated way. Absolutely, thank you. So that moves me on to the next bit, which is Right, um, as an SME or a business um, uh, in future flight and or looking to bid, what is the most practical practical thing and how can we engage? And I think you've got a slide on, on that, so um, I'll invite you to share. We do indeed, so next slide, please. Um, so obviously, you know, in a utopian ideal world, we all know it would be really valuable for us to collaborate across different communities of research, across different sort of industry or public sector stakeholders and policy and regulatory stakeholders. And we really do want to see that happen. But we also recognise and understand the pressure that a number of companies are under, um, whether that's from your startup SME to your larger scale organisation. There, are, you're under pressure to deliver 
in a different landscape to um, the kind of landscape that we work in as um, social science researchers and academics. So we're here and available to support um, at every step of the way, support, assist, advise, um, at, and at various points, and obviously prior to the phase three submissions. So there's plenty of things that we can do. There's drop-in sessions that will be running on the 12th and 13th of October, and more details um, of that will be shared um, in due course. There will be opportunities for people to join the co-creation workshops that I mentioned around different themes. And I think it's really important for us to have that sort of cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral engagement in those. Um, and uh, myself, Louise and Will in my team um, are available to meet and advise um, throughout program activity. And this could be anything from sense checking ideas, thinking through research design, um, or linking you in um, with the relevant expertise from across our academic social science research um, communities as well. So as I said, we do understand the pressures you're under. We all know this is important and it's important we work collectively to, to sort of realise this vision um, and we're here to help. Absolutely. Thank you, Fern. And um, it's one of the ways we're embedding this into the challenge um, so that we're, we're working closely together. OK, so on that note, I'll thank uh, our um, the panelists today for your valuable contributions for unpacking this with me and there's a lot more to talk about and discuss so we invite um, our future flight uh, community to please come and engage with us and um, we want to provide as much uh, information uh, uh, for you as possible on these topics and um, things that may not be you know um, uh, just uh, known in, in your field, we want to provide some access to experts um, who can provide advice and guide and work together and collaborate for phase three projects as well. So please do get involved. So um, thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you for your um, valuable contributions. And like I've said, with an industry background, um, I'm learning every day about social science and it's really important that we continue to share this with our industry and stakeholders, so thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next slide, please. Right, so please join us for our next Future Flight Friday webinar, which will be on the 29th of October. In the run-up to COP26, we'll be looking at um, and discussing a sustainable aviation flight path. So um, the role of Future Flight and beyond in um, sustainable aviation. So thank you all for your time, and I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. <laughs>